Republicans at issue. So we're still right here in the same political box today. In my word, the Congress of the United States is the most important institution in the world on this issue. If the United States cannot act, the rest of the world can't move. And I've seen that as a diplomat. We cannot go back to the negotiating table of the world without a Congress that will give the, the administration the authority to negotiate something and implement it. So I think that the Congress is the problem, and not just for us, but it's for everybody else on this planet. That's the judiciary. And just a few days ago, the Supreme Court rejected the uh, Trump administration's latest attempt to stop the Our Children's Trust lawsuit. I think a very important lawsuit that your granddaughter was part of. Yeah, yeah. And uh, carrying on the tradition. And, and actually, I'm a plaintiff also, a, a guardian of future generations. But we're not, we don't want to make an issue of that. They might be able to, to say that I'm not allowed to do that. But the young people clearly have a constitutional rights that are being violated. And I think that even a conservative Supreme Court is going to recognize this. So I think this is really important. And the trial will begin in late October at uh, the uh, district court level. What do you? What is your dream scenario for what that trial could result in? Uh, I the the they need to put the the courts cannot. It's like uh, civil rights. They can only rule that the the rights are being violated. They can't define the solution. But that's why the companion organization called Citizens Climate Lobby, which is, is uh, now got uh, uh, more than 90,000 members in the United States, but they are advocating this carbon fee and dividend, and they're doing it in a very uh, low key, uh, in a, a very, uh, a, a way which does not excite, cause problems, it's bipartisan. They, they get an equal number of Republicans and Democrats to sign on to this idea of a, a rising carbon fee. And they're making a lot of progress. So that needs to be ready so that when the Supreme Court says, you've got to do something, we can't tell you exactly how to do it. We have to make sure that that happens rather than all deliberate speed. You know, in the civil rights case, Brown versus Board of Education it was 1954. But it took a long time before we actually started to get action. Uh, and we can't afford that kind of delay in this case. So that's why this simultaneous work with Congress and trying to get them to accept what is a conservative <coughs> solution. Let the market Let me help ask you about that. Let me ask about the, the working with Congress and having them accept what is a conservative solution. We heard from Ray just now who had some strong words for the, the current Congress. You've been working at this intersection between science and, and government for 40 years. Do you find the current political system more intransigent, harder to speak to? Do you think that the political obstacles are, are more difficult to move than they were 35, 40 years ago? Well, we have a very unique situation <laughs> right at the moment. But the truth is that uh, if those, most Republicans actually like the idea of less regulations, more letting the market make the prices honest. That argument is, is basically a conservative argument. So uh, once, the, once we're forced, they're forced to do something, uh, I, think, I think that it can work despite the president. Uh, go ahead. Well, I'm not sure how the courts force the Congress to put in a tax, but it can sure help. Uh, I think Jim is right. I mean, one of the elements that Jim identified here is the need for bipartisan. You can't pass a tax without bipartisan uh, agreement. Because what's happened twice now is the Republicans have clobbered the Democrats in the election following the Democrats' attempt to put a price 
on carbon. It happened with BT tax and it happened with Waxman Markey legislation. So you really have to have a bipartisan approach. So how does the Republican Party, those within it, escape the denial of stranglehold? That's pretty, you know, good journalism, right? <laughs> so uh, that's the way, you know. So this is the quandary of our time. Now, I will then now move to a solution. One word, Florida. Sea level rise is an existential threat to Florida. We now see sea level rise impacting property values. Blue sky flooding in Florida is already occurring because there's been enough sea level rise, so when the moon is making those biggest highs, we're now seeing flooding in many places in South Florida. The three largest newspapers in South Florida, the Palm Beach Post, the Sun Sentinel, and Miami Herald, have formed a collaborative, an editorial collaborative about the issue of the century for Florida. Sea level rise. Now, there are five or six purple states where this is true. You use the impact to drive the issue. Rather than speaking globally, concentrate on the impacts that are identifiable, attributable to climate change that are profound. Florida is a great example because this is it. Do we want Florida, a Florida for the future? And if we, there's a lot of organizing, a lot of work going on in Florida to try to move the politics. And some of the key sponsors of these bipartisan effort on taxes are Floridian Republicans. How come? Because the impact trumps the politics. Oh, excuse me. The impact, uh, <laughs> you know, you just ruin the language. So, so help me out here. <laughs> well, actually, that's a perfect segue to my next question, which is for you, Daniel, and it's about journalism. And I just have a couple more questions, and then, as I said earlier, we're going to throw it open questions from you all. We have plenty of time, and I hope you will have many questions for these three. Um, you, you're a journalist. You also are a fiction writer. In fact, you, you wrote a novel about climate change uh, a while back. Um, but I want to ask you a question about being a journalist. You, you care very deeply about environmental studied and written about them. But you don't write as an advocate, you write as a, as a journalist. And I wonder where you feel like that line is drawn for you, and, and whether you feel sort of like the question that I asked uh, Jim earlier, you know, when do you sort of put down your tools as a scientist and decide that you're going to act more politically to get a message across? And I want to ask that question to you as a journalist, which is also a, a science. Um, how do you kind of handle the tension between uh, journalism and advocacy in this type of work? Well, climate change is an unusual subject in that it, it almost seems to demand a kind of activist tone from a lot of folks who write about the subject, which I understand on a human level. It's right. uh, the problem so bad. such a bad problem. It's, it's uh, so difficult, and there's a real problem of arousing interest. Um, there's also the problem of propaganda coming on the other side. So I think there's a kind of knee-jerk sense that, well, we need to fight fire with fire and return the propaganda of the American Petroleum Institute or, or whoever. Um, that, however, is not how I see writing. I don't, I don't believe that the role of a writer, um, I believe that the responsibility of the writer is to tell the truth um, and to find the truth. And um, I think, uh, climate change needs more activism. I think it needs um, better writing in support of that activism. Um, but I don't, that's not where I see my role, and it's not really where I see the role of um, journalism, period. Um, and uh, I think that's, it's, it's awkward with this subject, but I feel very strongly about that. I think that's always the writers that I've most admired, including ones who wrote about the pressing issues of their time. Um, you know, I think of someone like James Baldwin, he, he viciously uh, reacted to any, any um, suggestion that he might be an activist, he managed to anger every activist. Uh, there's a long tradition of, of that. Um, and so I, I'm, I uh, subscribe to his idea and the idea of many other writers that their responsibility is towards the truth, and um, and then live with the results. Mm -hmm. oh, then, a, then a last question for you two gentlemen. Um, Jim, I'll start with you. Uh, 
there's a lot of people in the audience tonight, I'm sure, who are here because they care very deeply about this issue. And probably some in the audience who work on it professionally, probably some in the audience who, you know, volunteer in one form or another, or who, you know, donate money, or who consider themselves people who are engaged deeply in this issue because it scares them and because they care about the future. Um, you've been working on this issue for 40 years. You've been trying to advance the ball. You've been trying to get things to change. And a lot of that time, it, it seems to me like you've been met with frustration, or at least things haven't moved as fast as you'd like. Them. People haven't listened. Um, Rafe, I would say that the same, the same about you. You know, we, here we are doing this story because we missed our opportunity in the 80s. Um, it's a very sad story. You know, I read Nathaniel's story, and it, it's, I find it to be a very sad story. But part of what gives me hope reading that story is the two of you, honestly. It's the, the ability that you seem to have had over this period of four decades to kind of renew your energy, to continue to work on this. And so I wonder how you do that, how you renew your energy with such a daunting task, and what you would say to the people in the audience who maybe are facing you know, many decades of their own ahead of them where they're going to want to work or think or study or read about this issue and themselves are going to need to be able to renew their energy. That we have to be ready the next time there's an opportunity. There was a, another opportunity in, beyond this time period, and that was in uh, 2008 when Obama was elected. Uh, if he had understood the problem and had been advised well, he had a great opportunity. Just, uh, because of the financial crisis was actually, there are many reasons why putting a price on carbon and in a way where you give the money to the public addresses the economic problem, addresses national security. Um, and he had control of both houses of Congress and he did not, you know, I, I uh, wrote a letter to him after he was elected before he took office. And I couldn't get John Holden to deliver it to him. But I tried to make this, this case why he should give this first priority. And, and if he had done that, I think you know, we, if we just get that started, you know, the, where if you distribute the money from a carbon fee uniformly, 70% of the people come on ahead. So they won't mind seeing the price of carbon go up. And that would stimulate uh, the changes that we need in our energy system, our energy use uh, that we need. And it has to be the United, the United States really needs to lead this. So we had that chance. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in 2020, but in my paper, Young People's Burden, that was published last year, we do all our scenarios starting in 2021. <laughs> we're assuming we're going to have another chance. Uh, but uh, you, we have to define, you know, and, and the truth is, you could, if you would begin to reduce emissions just 3% a year, you could still stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. It's just that we're not doing that. We're allowing fossil fuels to be the cheapest energy, and countries that are trying to raise people out of poverty, like India, have really no practical alternative to burning coal. So you are able to continue to generate hope in the face of a daunting task. Well, you, you're optimistic. Okay, so you look at the other planets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Elon Musk thinks, well, maybe we can escape to Mars. Well, right. that, that's silly. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've got to, we, we, we have to, we, this is still a remarkable planet, even with fires burning and things. We, it's still, it's worth saving at this point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Rafe, let me, let me ask you that question then. What is it, you know, you've been, you, you, as an activist, as an advocate, as a lobbyist, you've been working on this for 40 years. How do you bring it home? How do I bring it home? Well, um, the, the issue is uh, so profound, so interesting, and the consequences are so great that uh, it hasn't been that difficult to kind of stay with it. I mean, 
I have the privilege, I talk to people in all pieces of this problem. I mean, I talk to great scientists, I talk to great economists, I talk to diplomats, I was one. To me, you know, you talk to all people who will all have a piece of this. It's the economists who decide how to design <coughs> carbon pricing and so on. So how do you piece all that together? So that's a, it's a fascinating job with the concept. What else is there to work on? There's nothing to do with this. You know, so that's what people ask them. How do you keep going? What else should I do? Uh, this is as big as it gets. And it is as big as it gets. So uh, I'm with Jim. And that's the next opportunity. We have to do, uh, better do it better. And it has to have a, as hard as it seems, because his denialist grip the Republican Party is actually partially Republican, but it's brought to us by a host of organizations that control the money to those people. And uh, some call it the Coke Network, you know? You look at the organizations that signed a letter in support of Scalise, and there they are. <laughs> Even the, you know, the, the, the Exxon is trying to find its way back from having done us in with the denialist campaign. They support tax. So I'm a little bit, I have to say, uh, what we need is a vision of how to do this comprehensively that is as big as the problem. As big as the problem, and it's going to require great political leadership. There are, many, there are several elements of it, but remember, you have to move the United States, and you have to move the entire planet, and you have to do it on time. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about Nathaniel's piece is it this retrospective tells us where we were and how deeply in the hole we've come since we had a, an opportunity, a, a big opportunity. And that is the power of the piece. Go back to that Charney meeting and see what we do. Yeah. So... Uh, <coughs> I want to finish one thing. Yeah. I spent a lot of time working on the Arctic. Why? The Arctic is unraveling, and it's very visible. It's the, the data is overwhelming, and the, all these, the photography of the Arctic is phenomenal. The sea ice is going, the permafrost is melting, Greenland is shrinking, we, like to say, we don't like to say, but the fate of Greenland is the fate of Miami. That's how you make the political connection. So, uh, we need to dream, we have to have very big dreams that scale to the size of the problem. And then you got to win the politics. You have to win the politics. That's tough. We have failed that over and over again. But uh, I think the impacts, particularly sea level rise, can change all that. Sorry for the long winded No, no, no. <laughs> so listen, we're going to open up the questions. Before, before we do, I, I want to just recognize one last time these three gentlemen on stage. We also want other, we have George Steinmetz in the audience tonight, the photographer who took these amazing pictures. Where are you, George? Would you please stand up? something in the last couple of days, which will be the preview to the article by David Keith on carbon capture in the journal Jewel. And I say that it's immoral that we left young people, the coming generation, with no options. We did not do, we did not look at the options. We, we decided we're going to tell them, you, you have to solve the problem with renewable energies. We're not going to do the R&D on next generation nuclear, so you'll have that to consider as a possibility. So China and India have no choice. They're, they're getting all their energy from uh, burning coal. Uh, and uh, we, energy is what raised our standard of living in the Western world, and now the rest of the world wants to raise their standard of living. And if we're gonna deal with global population, 
And what we see is that those nations that do raise their standard of living get the energy that's needed to do that. The fertility rate goes down and, and we could have a chance of solving the problem. The fundamental difficulty with this problem is the delayed response of the system. The Earth is presently out of energy balance because it does not warm up quickly as you add the gases. So there's more warming in the pipeline. And uh, it, just to get us back to energy balance will take a tremendous amount of reduction in the CO2 in the atmosphere, actually back to about 350 parts per million. And that would just rebalance the systems so it would stop additional warming. Uh, I think partly the question was about sequestration, carbon sequestration. Yeah, so, so, that, so that's actually the uh, article by David Keith that's about to come out where they've now developed an actual uh, pretty big scale model of carbon capture and showed what it will cost. And it's and the media is starting to pick this up and say, oh, that's not so expensive compared to what the National Academy of Science had estimated several years ago. However, the price actually does that he gives does not include the cost of of storing the CO2, which adds to it and and that price that he gives is actually larger than the price that we assumed in our paper last year, Young People's Burden, where we show that continued fossil fuel emissions will leave young people with a bill of the order of hundreds of trillions of dollars. Uh, so his cost is high. So it's not very encouraging with, there's no uh, uh, magic, solution. There's no uh, uh, get out of jail free uh, card um, uh, that we can find. Let's take a few more questions. Uh, let's see. Yes, right here. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about climate change and, and how it will affect my family and where should we go to stay safe? To, to stay safe. Where, where you should go to stay safe? Yeah. This is an example of the kind of question that's that's going to come up more often. And, and, and when I hear you say that, um, I can't help but hearing a sense of um, dread, dread, obviously. But also, you know, I, I think the, the question, at least as I interpret it, is how did we end up here? How did previous generations let this happen? And I don't think that's a question we really started to reckon with in a serious way. And I think. Um, my hope with this piece is that we get into a larger discussion about that. I mean, when you hear about um, even whether we're talking about the summer of 1988 or we're looking at these images by George Steinmetz, there's, we're talking about Florida, there's this idea that an immediate, if, okay, if people are immediately in crisis, they will start to understand what we're facing. And that, I think that's, that makes sense, but I feel like it's a very limited moral argument um, that only if your self-interest is in direct immediate danger yeah. that it's time to act. And we don't think about other social problems um, in that in that way. Um, so I, I think there's more to it, but I'll, I'll let someone yeah, else right. talk about where it's safe because I don't know the answer. Um, it's a great question, and every family has to think about it. Be careful about, to ask your parents, uh, exactly where are you buying a home? Just one example. Don't buy it on the coast like in Kansas. <laughs> Why would you buy a house on the coast where you're faced with sea level rise? So I go to your parents is a good start. Where are we going to be safe? Not just for the next 20 years, but the next 50. I'm thinking about it. One of the interesting things about the climate problem is it changed this. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little over. <laughs> It changed, this is a, 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 an assertion, it changes all real estate. Nobody knows quite what the home that you own today will be like in 30 years or 50 years or maybe even 20. Somebody think about it. So it's a good discussion with your parents. Let me leave it at that. I think it's larger. I think there's real estate. one other important. Are you going to just tell her where to move? <laughs> I hope. With regard to 
location, one thing that uh, we showed in a recent paper is that low latitudes, the tropics and the subtropics in the summer, are becoming uncomfortably hot. And these are locations where the people living there did not cause the problem. So this is another injustice where the industrial world is causing a problem for the other parts of the world. And it's all the more reason that in addition you had the intergenerational injustice and the interspecies injustice. We, we should, there's so much evidence that we should now address this. And we just are pretending we don't understand this. I think it was around 2003, I attended an ICLI as the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. And I met a gentleman by the name of Peter Barnes, who proposed in a book that he wrote in 2001, Who Owns the Sky? A tax and dividend program that is somewhere akin to what's happening in Alaska. And I'd really like to hear your comments on that proposed legislation. Peter, Peter Barnes is actually the one who advocated the dividend, but he proposed a cap and dividend. And I've been arguing with him <laughs> ever since. Because how, what is the cap on India? See, if you, if you do it with a cap approach, then you've got 190 different caps for different countries, and they you have to negotiate each of those caps. While if you do it with a carbon fee or carbon tax, then you, that, you can make that near global with border duties. If just the United States would decide to do it, or better if the US and China would agree to have a carbon fee, but the US could impose it, frankly. Uh, you, you, by putting a border duty on products from countries that do not have a carbon fee, that encourages them to have their own carbon fee so they can collect the money themselves, rather than have us collect it at the border. So that's the difference between a cap and a tax. It's really important, but it's kind of technical. Well, with that, we're going to have to end the evening. I want to, again, thank you.